Welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. I'm your host, Tom Rosenbauer, and in this episode, I want to share something with you that I really love, and that's saltwater fly fishing in shallow water. It's mostly sight fishing, which nearly every fly fisher loves. It's hunting the fish, you see the fish, you sneak up on them, you present a fly to them, and then you're off to the races. It's great fun. Hope you enjoy the show. Stay with us. Because this is the way you cast. This show has been brought to you by Orvis Rod and Tackle. Ontario, yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region, where Huron and Superior meet. Saltwater fly fishing can be long bouts of drifting, looking, waiting, anticipating. When you finally get onto the fish, that's when everything explodes. It's a big ocean out here. The first thing you have to do is find the kind of habitat that both the fish and their prey like. In saltwater shallow areas, predator fish like bonefish, redfish, and stripers will congregate to search for prey. But like in a freshwater lake, not all shallow water areas hold fish. What's critical to locating fish is finding the right structure or habitat that the prey prefers. Shallow water holds much more of the important food sources such as crabs, shrimp, and bait fish than deep water. This is what draws the game fish we seek. Additionally, some species of game fish come into the shallows to escape larger predators such as sharks. Anything that juts into the water and provides a haven for prey like bayfish or crabs is a likely place. Jetties, rocky shorelines, and even docks can be places to find saltwater fish. And even a seemingly monotonous and barren beach can be red like a trout stream. There are clues that indicate fish holding structure both on land and in the water. On beaches, look for points, sandbars, or little bays where bigger fish can pen in bait fish. In an otherwise featureless shoreline, that's at least a good place to start. Of course, you always look first for fish feeding on bait fish near the surface, but you don't always see that. In places we call flats or large expanses of shallow water, first look for signs that fish have been feeding. Bonefish leave depressions in the mud or sand when they root for crabs and shrimp, and because the layer underneath oxidizes really quickly from dark to light, the darker the marks, the more recently bonefish have been in the area. Also look for patches of weeds or depressions on the flats that hold crabs, shrimp, and baitfish. Mangroves always hide food for bonefish, tarpon, barracuda, sharks, and redfish. So always search out places with lots of mangroves in the tropics, or at least patches of them. Besides structure, there are other ways of locating game fish in the shallows. Birds diving on bait fish is one of the best. It's amazing how quickly birds will find feeding fish and dive on the bait fish they push to the surface. Look for bait fish jumping from the water, fish rising to the surface just like trout in a stream, or tails or fins sticking out of the water. These are the quickest ways to locate feeding game fish. Intertidal zones are some of the most productive ecosystems in the world. They're packed with shrimp and crabs and bait fish and all other kinds of life. They're often too dry or the water's too shallow for game fish at low tide. As the tide rises on an incoming tide, the game fish then come in in search of these prey items. Game fish respond to the tides and follow a rising tide into the shallows to get at creatures they can't get at low tide. The shallow water of low tide also makes it harder for prey to escape because crabs, shrimp, and baitfish have little room to maneuver in the shallows. Outgoing tides also flush prey from marshes and creeks, bringing these food sources to game fish that wade in slightly deeper water. In general, any amount of water movement produces good fishing, and whether the outgoing or the incoming tide is better really varies from location to location. Okay. 
Now that we understand what attracts game fish into shallow water, let's examine how we fly fish for them. Nice bonefish, yes. If you've done any saltwater fishing, you may have caught fish with a lure like I'm doing here. Fly fishing in saltwater is just another way of fishing, just another way of getting a lure to the fish. In spin fishing, you have a weighted lure. This is a lead jig, and you have skinny monofilament line. The weight of the lure pulls this skinny line off the reel and takes it out there. In fly fishing, it's not that much different. You've got a lure attached to a piece of monofilament line, except I can't get this lure very far by itself. It won't pull line off a reel. So instead, I cast this thick fly line. It has mass, and this is actually what I cast. I cast the line, not the fly. So the term casting a fly is really a misnomer. You're casting the line. The fly just goes along for the ride. You can cast farther and cover more water with a lure on a spin rod, but we can imitate the same prey on a fly rod. Because you can't get as much distance with a fly rod, it's more of a stalking game where you try to get close to the fish and make short, accurate casts. That's part of the excitement of fly fishing. It's a more intimate and challenging way of catching fish in salt water. In shallow water fly fishing, the fish almost always move, so casts need to be quick and accurate. You often have only one shot at a feeding fish, so you have to make it count. Look at all those fish coming at us. There's bonefish everywhere, 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 everywhere. And they're all around us, and it's very, very frustrating when you have the... There's a shark in there, too. That fish got off. Saltwater rods are beefier in the butt so that you can fight big fish, and they also throw a bigger size line. You need that heavier line size to cast into the wind and throw the bigger flies that you're throwing in salt water. For smaller bonefish, small striped bass, redfish, and speckled trout, fish up to about 10 pounds, an eight weight rod is about right. The same rod you might use for freshwater bass. When you get into heavier winds, bigger flies, and bigger fish like big striped bass, small tarpon, barracuda, sharks, and permit from 10 to 50 pounds, a nine weight or a 10 weight rod is a better choice. For most shallow water fishing, a floating line is all you need. But there are times when you'll need an intermediate or fast sinking line, especially in deep channels with lots of current or when fishing deep drop offs. Leaders for shallow water saltwater fly fishing are pretty simple. For most of the fishing you do, a nine foot, 12 pound knotless leader is all you need. Reels are a lot more critical in saltwater fly fishing than they are in freshwater fishing. You need a reel that'll handle at least 150 to 200 yards of backing, so it's gonna be a bigger reel. It needs to have a stronger drag to tire those bigger fish down. The large arbor can take in line quicker. If you have a fish that runs a long way and then runs back at you, you wanna be able to gather that line really quickly. Once you find what habitat the fish are on, then it's a matter of stalking them, and that's the fun part. Whether you're stalking fish on foot or from a boat, there are things you can do to avoid scaring fish and to present the fly in the proper manner. Even large game fish are spooked by boats and by fly lines landing near them, so always try to position yourself on the outside of a school, and if you can tell which direction the fish are moving, always try to have them moving toward you. So Jim, we've got a bunch of fish working in here in a fairly tight area. So what's the strategy in, in fishing like this? Well, you've got fish that are probably taking worms that are right in this, uh, in this region here. We're yep. going to come in and try to have good casts in here. But I don't want to get right in the middle of my... I just want to stand on just on the outside. So we want to stay on the edge of right. the school that's feeding in right. here, not we, run right in the middle. Right, because if we drive through the middle, we're going to put these fish down. Yep. Sometimes you'll see signs on the surface, like fish waking or sticking their tails and dorsal fins in the air when in shallow water, but often you have to spot them below the surface. Polarized sunglasses with amber, copper, or rose tints are best, and it's essential to wear a hat to keep bright light off your eyes. Most fish at your stock will be moving, so pay attention to any movement below the surface. Look for these things. 
nervous water where a riffle runs contrary to the wind, shapes in the water that move, the flash of a fish turning on its side to feed, or the glint of a fin sticking above the water. Learn to recognize the shape and color of the fish you're looking for. Bonefish can range from almost white to bluish gray to almost black. Permit and Barracuda are the same shade with a black tail. Redfish look rusty colored, and striped bass and tarpon are typically bluish gray or green. Fish are easiest to spot on bright sunny days over light bottoms and difficult to spot over mixed bottoms or grass beds. It sometimes helps to watch the light spots in between darker patches for fish passing through. One of the things you want to do when you're stalking fish in shallow flat water like this is to move carefully, move slowly, shuffle your feet, and try not to push a wake in front of you. Fish can sense that wake in the water and they know you're coming. You don't want to just stride right out into the flat because you will scare the fish. And what you hope for is to have the fish coming at you. That's the best shot because you throw the fly in front of them and then the fly it looks like it's escaping from the fish. If you don't get that shot, if you get a crossing shot, that's not quite as good, but it's still decent. The worst shot of all is a going away shot where the fish are going away from you because you have to pretty much throw over their back and then the fly comes back at them. Once in a while they'll take it that way, you take the shot anyway. Pulling a flats boat is a superb skill and the best guides can sneak up on a fish with barely a sound. But fishing with a guide is a team effort. You have to do your part not only with casting and presenting the fly, but also by keeping noise to a minimum. And if you're fishing with a buddy, make sure you not only help look for fish, but keep track of his or her line to make sure there are no tangles if a big fish <laughs> decides to take line. When you're fishing in a boat with a guide, whether it's a flats boat or a big offshore boat, you always want to be able to communicate both distance and direction. So direction, you use the points of the clock. Straight off the bow is always 12 o'clock. This way is always 9 o'clock. This way is always 3 o'clock with the other points in between. So you both can communicate. You've got a relative frame of reference. The other thing you need to be able to communicate with your guide is distance. So what you do is you make a cast. How long was that cast? 35 feet. 35 feet. Okay, it looks like 35 feet to me, so we're both in agreement. Now, when Greg says bonefish at 11 o'clock, 35 feet, I know it's going to be that length of line in that direction. One of the problems some anglers have is they forget the boat's moving. The fly won't move until all the slack in the line has been removed. So make sure that if the boat's moving toward the fish when you present the fly, that you immediately take up all the slack in the line. Now that you're in position, let's talk about ways that you on your own or you and your guide can work together as a team to place the fly as naturally as possible. Once you see a moving fish, where should you put the fly in relation to that fish? In shallow water, you want to lead it by just a little bit. You sometimes even want to put the fly right on the fish's head or right in front of his head. The fly is going to sink quickly to the fish's level. When you get in deeper water, it's more like a game of chess where you're strategic or it's more like shooting a bird in that you've got to let that fly sink to the fish's level. It's going to take longer, so you have to lead that fish, try to figure out where it's going to be, let the fly sink to the fish so that you can begin stripping right when the fly's at the fish's level. Once you get the fly close to the fish, your next decision is how to retrieve it. Some fish will rush right over and grab the fly when it lands, which makes your job simple but most times that doesn't happen. Where you present the fly and how you retrieve it is usually a lot more important than the fly pattern you have on. So you need to experiment with retrieves. Sometimes a little bit of slow, steady, bump, bump, bump. Sometimes a very slow retrieve. Sometimes a very fast, aggressive strip works better. You never know what's gonna work, so you have to keep experimenting until you crack the code. In salt water, Instead of imitating insects, we imitate prey like crustaceans and baitfish. They might range from tiny shrimp imitations for bonefish, permit, and redfish to large baitfish flies that imitate such fish as herring and mullet. Crab flies are especially effective in shallow waters as most game fish find it very hard to resist a crab. When we return, we'll learn some of the basic casts you need to get to the fish, 
and how to handle them once they take the fly. Casting in salt water is so important. It's more important than in any other kind of fishing. Not only does the double haul help you with distance, it also helps you cast into the wind. Let's go to my friend Pete Kutzer for some solid tips on the double haul. There are times when we do have to gain a little bit more line speed. Let's say we're dealing with windy conditions, casting larger flies, maybe a little bit more distance, and that's when the double haul is going to come in play. And a lot of people think it's just a saltwater cast. Believe it or not, I use the double haul whenever I cast, say over 30 feet. It actually takes a lot of strain off of our casting hand. Uh, it makes that cast easier uh, when you're dealing with those longer distances. Before you start the double haul, you want to make sure that you can get that pick up and lay down cast consistently, nice smooth tight loops, and your uh, shooting line consistently as well. Once you start to shoot line, then we can think about that double haul. But first, we need to understand how this cast works. When we make a basic back cast, we're starting with that forearm, bringing that rod back, then applying that little pop to a stop or that little flick. Then when we come forward, we're doing the same thing just in the opposite direction. Think pop to a stop, pop to a stop with a smooth acceleration in between. When I start to haul, the haul actually does the same thing as that flick to a stop. I'm going to lock out my wrist and just tug on the line and you're going to notice that that line starts to jump behind me and in front of me. There's one key part though we have to think about with this double haul and that's the reposition. After we tug on this line, we have to drift back to set up for that haul on the forward cast. So we come back, haul, and then drift, set up, you know, maybe a haul of 18 to 24 inches, then haul and drift on the forward cast. Haul and drift, come forward, haul, and drift. When practicing hauling, I like to practice one side at a time. I like to make that haul and that reposition and let that line set on the ground, then haul and reposition in front of me, working with that same consistent length of line. When you're casting or actually fishing, you're going to do the same thing, just you're not going to let it touch. You might make a couple hauls and false cast in between. It's a little bit more of an aggressive haul, not too much more. So we haul, reposition, haul, reposition. Then when I deliver that cast, I'm going to make that nice haul down by my pocket. Remember to feather that line back up underneath that finger, closing that bale, and then we can start to strip that line back in. Once you've learned the basics of the double haul, now we have to begin to try and fine tune that double haul. Remember, when we're saltwater fishing, speed and accuracy is of the essence. We want to get that fly to that fish right away, so we don't want to false cast a lot. So there's a couple things that we can do. Haul, shoot a little bit of line, haul, shoot that line, now back underneath that finger, closing that bale. That's going to help get that long cast quickly. Remember, get that fly to the fish, okay? Don't have it up in the air. As we progress with this double haul, let's say we're dealing with windy conditions, and we got to make that nice tight loop and deal with that wind, what we want to start to do is make this haul a nice smooth transition from one haul to the next. And our hauling hand actually starts to move in a little bit of a circle. We're going to haul, reposition, haul, reposition, haul, reposition. We're going to keep that hand moving. So nice and smooth, reposition, nice and smooth, reposition. Keeping that hand continuously moving and that can help us deliver that fly out quickly to that fish. When dealing with quick moving fish, we want to get that fly in front of that fish as soon as possible. If that fish is, let's say, at a 90 degree angle, directly off my right hand shoulder, and I was just casting straight out in front of me, I can cut that angle in half, maybe make a cast at a 45, then quickly to that 90. So I'd pick this line up, cut that angle in half, then turn and deliver that fly out to that fish as quickly as possible. If that fish was, let's say, beyond 90 degrees, what I could do is make a false cast in front of me and make a back cast delivering that fly to that fish. Pick it up, cast in this direction, then deliver that fly out behind me to that fish. And that's how you can get that fly quickly in front of those targets. In salt water, it's important to avoid raising the rod tip to strike. This gives you a bad hooking angle, plus if the fish misses the fly, you don't want to launch your fly into the air. Instead, try to always strip strike, which is basically just making a long strip. If you miss the fish, it might jump on the fly again. And if you hook the fish, once it's tight to the fly, then you can raise your rod tip. A good rule of thumb is to never strike until you feel the weight of the fish. Give it a long strip, then raise the rod tip. Let's hear how my friend, veteran bonefish guy, Jason Franklin of H2O Outfitters describes it. One of the key things 
with presenting to saltwater fish, specifically moanfish, is that when you strip, what a lot of people do, and in saltwater we call this trouting, is that when they fill the fish, they lift. In saltwater, you don't want to do that. It pretty much guarantees that you're not going to catch the fish. What you need to do in saltwater is what we call a strip strike. So you present at the fish, strip, strip, notice the rod tips in the water, strip, fill the fish, once you fill the fish, then you lift. And by the strip, you're normally setting the hook. Fly fishing in salt water inshore shallows is a lot of fun. You have to stalk the game fish, you have to make precise casts so you don't spook the fish, and you have to fight the fish properly so you don't lose them. Best of all, this type of fishing is very visual. You'll usually see the fish take your fly. For most anglers, that's the ultimate thrill and challenge of this kind of fly fishing. Inshore fly fishing can be found almost anywhere in the world. Usually you do it from a boat, but in many places you can do it from shore waiting. It's relatively inexpensive to get started and it's really easy to do. I hope you've enjoyed this week's show on shallow water fly fishing in salt water. Thanks very much for letting me share my passion with you. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you've never treated yourself to shallow water fly fishing in salt water, you really should try it because it's a lot of fun. This show has been brought to you by Orvis Rod and Tackle. Ontario, yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region, where Huron and Superior meet.